Mark. All right. Let me share screen. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to our breakout session designing accessible and inclusive XR enhanced online learning experiences. My name is Jeremy Nelson. I am the director of an XR initiative at the Center for Academic Innovation at the University of Michigan. And our focus is really to bring XR technologies for teaching and learning, uh, to integrate those into our residential curricula at our 19 schools and colleges in the Ann Arbor campus, to integrate them into our online learning curricula, which we'll talk more about, we'll deep dive into today, uh, and to create innovative public-private partnerships. Uh, one of the ways that we've been able to support faculty across the university is to provide uh, innovation funding. And so we follow an innovation seed fund approach where faculty pitch us on ideas and how we they want to use XR technologies in the classroom where they're teaching. And so we've run two rounds of funding. Uh, we've funded 33 proposals. Uh, we've received 33 proposals. We funded 24 of them. Uh, from 11 of our 19 schools and colleges. And as you can see there, uh, a lot of interest from architecture, engineering, our, our College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, nursing, medicine, dentistry, uh, but also interesting from the law school, School of Music, Theater, and Dance, Environment, Sustainability, and Social Work. Uh, it's a really diverse set of uh, projects and, and uh, work spanning, uh, you know, the full spectrum of XR. Uh, and we just announced uh, in April uh, a partnership with Coursera to launch 10 XR enhanced course online courses uh, focused on the future of work. And so uh, building out a future of work academy. And so we'll be really looking at how do we make these uh, experiences uh, available and accessible uh, to a global online audience. Uh, so we'll be looking at things like interactive 360 video, mobile augmented reality, virtual production, uh, and then uh, where possible immersive virtual reality. Uh, looking at things like creative critical skills, soft skill development, role playing simulation, uh, and a lot of healthcare uh, and new technology skills. So I'll introduce our team here: uh, Jacob Fortman, a learning experience designer and graduate uh, certificate coordinator from the Center for Academic Innovation. I'm just going to introduce everybody. I think that'll probably be a little bit easier. Um, <laughs> Rebecca Quintana, our Associate Director for Learning Experience Design at the Center, Adjunct Lecturer in the School of Education. And so she helps design immersive learning experiences and pedagogical considerations for XR environments. Pam Saka, Learning Experience Designer for Accessibility, uh, working on accessible and inclusive design considerations for 360 video environments. Professor Anhong Guo, Assistant Professor of Computer Science and Engineering, the Director of our Human AI Lab, and he's working on making XR accessible and using XR to make the physical world accessible. It's pretty interesting to hear about some of his great work. Uh, and Professor Michael Niebling, the assistant professor in our School of Information, Computer Science and Engineering. He's the director of our Human Computer Interaction Lab, focused on XR. And he works to make things easy to design, develop, and ev evaluate adaptive XR experiences uh, in teaching. All right, so I will turn it over to our team here. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I really appreciate the chance to do this deep dive session. I'm going to give us started off with just kind of talking about some of the pedagogical frameworks that we kind of are engaging with when we're designing for extended reality um, courses that are enhancing our online courses. And so this, these are the pedagogical ideas that I see as really kind of undergirding our work uh, when we're thinking about extended reality technology and learning. Uh, so this notion of simulation pedagogy is really important to us. Um, this is, you know, when we're trying to think about how we can simulate immersive and authentic scenarios that can engage learners and help them transfer learning to real world scenarios. So some of our previous examples include, um, you know, uh, simulating a virtual reality nuclear reactor, uh, simulating high stakes uh, medical operations, things like that. These are really important scenarios where we want to make sure that learners have opportunities to fail in meaningful ways before they go off into the real world and can and can utilize these um, these uh, things that they're practicing. 
This notion of problem posing education is also really important to us. Uh, this is where learners are given agency to critically engage in real world problems. And this stands in distinction to the kind of traditional lecture based classroom where learners are passively absorbing information and lecture content is seen as kind of um, removed from the learners experiences. We really want learners to be engaged socially um, and, and be active contributors to the learning experience. And then this idea of grounded learning is also really foundational to us. Um, this is where we think about how new educational content is grounded in learners' prior experiences. Um, there's also an, an important kind of ethical component to this notion of grounded learning um, because the curriculum has uh, this kind of legitimizing effect. So when learners can see their experiences and their perspectives um, within the curriculum itself, um, it kind of um, reaffirms that the, the, the learner's perspectives and experiences are valid within, within the context of the curriculum. Uh, Jeremy, would you mind going to the next slide, please? Thank you. So some of the design practices that we engage with here at the Center for Academic Innovation include developing learner personas. Uh, these are utilized early on in the design process and helps us to concretize and empathize with our learner audiences. So this is when we really think critically about um, what a learner's background might be, what their motivations might be, um, what, where they might struggle within a course or within a certain type of experience, and what the accessibility considerations they might have um, uh, uh, really early on in the design process. After developing learner personas, we shift to developing learning outcomes. These are the actual goals that learners are to achieve within a within a curriculum or with an extended reality experience. And then we move on to uh, scripting and storyboarding uh, these extended reality experiences, which allows faculty and learning designers to visualize the learner's journey through an experience. And with that, I will hand it off to Rebecca. Thanks so much, Jacob and Jeremy. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we're starting to think about scaling up uh, XR enhanced learning experiences to the open online learning space. Um, I've had some experience with this in a much smaller type of a setting in a graduate education uh, context with you know 25 to 30 learners where you know it's possible to to really understand their individual needs and work with them to ensure that they're having uh, an equitable experience in the course. But when we think about scaling up to uh, a massive open online course, for instance, where um, you know there are no limitations placed on enrollment um, and they're usually quite affordable, we were we are going to anticipate. Uh, a wide range of learners who may be coming um, with various concerns, considerations, disabilities, and uh, so forth. So we need to really be intentional as we're thinking about scaling up here. In my own teaching, I, I often draw on the Universal Design for Learning framework advanced by Rose and his colleagues, as I'm sure many are aware of. Um, and it talks, you know, in terms of these three principles, which can be very helpful to instructors as they're thinking broadly about these matters. So providing multiple means of engagement, in other words, finding ways for learners to be motivated and to find connections to their own personal experiences, um, multiple means of representation. So this is extremely important as we're thinking about the integration of different kinds of media and online experiences. Um, we need to think about perhaps providing a range of options for our learners. And then multiple means of action and expression. How will learners be able to show what they know, show what they've learned? And again, providing many different ways for them to do that. When we think about uh, integrating VR, virtual reality, for instance, into our learning environments, we can anticipate there will be a lot of issues that could unfold and we need to be considerate of the potential for inequitable outcomes from the outset. So, you know, even in my own teaching, I've been challenged to think about issues of connectivity. Uh, you know, having a, a learner simply drop off of a learning experience because their bandwidth cannot accommodate um, you know, the requirements of that particular software or tool. Um, nausea is something that needs to be considered. Many learners cannot spend a lot of time in virtual reality and are feeling um, uneasy just physically because of the, um, the way it makes them feel. Mobility, thinking about movement and, um, you know, control, hand controllers and even just the weight of the headset itself can be an issue. 
neurodivergence, uh, you know, people experiencing um, these very intense uh, realistic experiences, comprehensive experiences in different ways, and, and disability, thinking about uh, auditory and visual impairments and so forth. How can we acknowledge and ensure that we are designing for the, um, the differences that we can anticipate in our learners from the outset? And I wrote emotions as well, because, you know, we can anticipate that some learners may become uncomfortable depending on the subject matter, depending on uh, their own life experiences. And because some of these virtual reality experiences and XR environments are so intense, uh, we need to be cogn cognizant of that from the outset. So in my own teaching and through some evaluation of um, our designs, I've been thinking about, you know, ways that we can start to um, make some progress as we consider uh, equity from the outset. So often in my own teaching, if I had a very sort of immersive experience that would require, let's say, a lot of bandwidth or a very intense type of emotional experience, I would pair that with a lower immersion option. So that could be reading a script, that could be watching a video of a walkthrough of the same experience and so on. So making sure that learners can sort of adjust and calibrate according to their, their own particular needs. Um, and then following very immersive, intense experiences with lower immersion options to kind of allow people to decompress, to debrief and so forth as something that has been working um, in my teaching context. Next slide, please, Jeremy. So then how do we think about this at scale, as I said, and online? So uh, my colleagues and I are embarking on the design of a new MOOC series, a five course series on learning experience design. We actually start our design process next week. And we're going to be thinking about enhancing that experience with some XR integration. And as I said, at scale. So we'll be thinking about ways that uh, our learners can be developing different professional skills. Um, generally speaking, thinking about um, immersion in you know, authentic design contexts, what that might look like, feel like, um, be like, enacting different competencies that a learning experience designer may need to uh, develop for professional um, success, and then reflection on uh, design processes. So we don't necessarily have a fully uh, developed idea of what this will be, but, you know, we're thinking about developing different types of immersive scenarios, perhaps around activities like course mapping, uh, the visualization of learning designs through different um, you know, structures and, and uh, arrangement sequences of design elements and so forth, um, kind of embracing the messiness of the design space and again, replicating what that may be like in a professional context. And then thinking about the interactions that we have with project shareholders, um, including learning professionals and subject matter experts and really modeling and practicing those things. Next slide, please, Jeremy. So my colleague Pam is going to go into more detail about uh, 360 video uh, and 360 camera and how we're kind of thinking about that as one way we could enhance a learning experience at scale. But I did want to talk a little bit about how, you know, as I mentioned, the multiple ways into an experience, um, it might be possible to have someone interact with media created through a 360 camera, so a 360 video in different ways. So it could be through a desktop computer, uh, it could be through a mobile phone, it could be through a headset, and it could also be the same script that we would use to create the video in the first place could be presented as a textual option. So that's kind of what we're thinking about, um, and I'm going to ask Pam to uh, describe a little bit more in detail. Okay, uh, next slide, Jimmy. Thank you. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we actually design these um, XR experiences, thinking about 360 video in particular. And my role at the Center for Academic Innovation generally entails working with design teams and faculty members to really create the content that's going to go into our MOOCs. So um, our main goal really is to make learning experiences that are accessible to the widest variety of people possible. So we need to identify um, a lot of the barriers that go into our designs. So access for our XR courses, as Rebecca um, showed previously, 
is really considering whether learners can actually get to the XR enhanced components of the course or not. So do they have access to the devices or special equipment? Do they have a fast enough internet connection, um, as Rebecca mentioned, um, to actually load the content we've created? Um, so in the image on this slide, there is a 360 scene at a train station um, with people walking quickly in various paths and directions. And this was actually taken from a video with moving people. So the learner would get a better understanding of the feeling of being in a busy train station. As a still image, um, some of the immersion um, and emotion might be lost in the scene. So we really have to make careful decisions about the impact of um, what content we choose and how what impact it has on the experience. Uh, next slide, please. So the next question then is, are learners actually having a good experience while they're using the XR components? This is what the accessibility piece is. So within XR enhanced components that we're building, we're not completely replacing learning activities with XR, but we're using the XR experiences more as a supplemental activity in a MOOC. So we think that you know, there should be no required content within the XR activity, nothing that would keep a learner from making progress in the course. Uh, we're also considering things like environmental color contrast. So in the example on the slide, we have an image of an office and there's a text box in the scene and the text is light blue. It's on a white kind of translucent background, which is then also overlaid over the image um, of actually vertical blinds in an office. So it's hard to read. It's three separate layers of um, visual elements. And just thinking through backgrounds, they need to be solid fill, they need to be high contrast. Um, we're also thinking about audio and the role that ambient noise might play in a scene, um, whether it's helpful for immersion or whether it's overload for the senses. So it's an interesting balance to kind of think through. And for learners who aren't going to go through our XR enhanced components, we do need to have alternatives. So. Like Rebecca mentioned, do we record someone doing a voice narrated demo within the environment? And then we have kind of like a regular video that they could just watch on YouTube or something. Do we take still shots from our experiences and make some kind of a map with long descriptions? Um, we're, we're still unsure in which way we might go and we're curious to hear um, your thoughts on this and how we might accomplish those. Uh, next slide, please. So the last section I'll talk about briefly is more about specific design guidelines we're following as we are just starting to build some of our 360 video experiences. So we are drawing on the WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and we really want uh, cohesion, not only within each XR experience, but also across all of the courses that we're going to have XR within. So we're thinking a lot about color palettes, pairing with simple fonts, so readability. Um, the images on this slide show dark text on a light background and light text on a dark background. So really thinking through what our options are in terms of uh, cohesive design, um, utilizing the text to speech options within our platform. So we have both text and audio of the same information. Uh, we're thinking a lot about logical navigation between scenes. So if a learner um, exits the XR experience or they get kicked out or something, do they lose their progress? Can they navigate back? Is it intuitive on how to get back to where they left off? Um, those types of considerations. Um, the last one that I found in the operable category that I thought was interesting was talking about uh, cursors and pointers, and if they are bold enough to be seen against the background, and if they are big enough to actually be usable to click on items. So if you have items you need to click in a scene and you're using a little virtual cursor, how you know, accurate do you have to be with getting exactly on the item to click on it? And last slide, Jeremy, please. Right, so to finish up, um, it's important that we really create understandable experiences. So reading level of content is really important to think about. It varies based on what your course is about, but if we're looking at targeting a global audience, we really need to make sure the content is written appropriately. 
Um, using a predictable icon set and predictable tags are important within the environment. In the, the image on this slide, there is a pink door tag with the words go to the share zone beneath. And we need to think about consistent tags and consistent naming structures so that learners can recognize what the tag does and they aren't surprised or confused if you keep switching um, what you're writing or showing. We're also brainstorming about adding a short user tutorial to the start of each experience that um, would help orient a learner to how to use the virtual tools and what kind of it might look like so they know what to expect. And the last part of this is, is something we're maybe most unclear on, but we're really looking for feedback on um, as we're really at an early stage of development, which is how do we make our experiences robust? So we can make them, but how do we make them very robust in nature? And that really leads to assistive technologies. So what types of assistive technologies work within our XR experiences? How can we design for them in particular? Um, and this is you know, an area we would love to get feedback from you all on if you have questions or comments about that to see what kind of challenges uh, you've encountered. So at this point, I will hand it back to Jeremy for some Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, Rebecca, and Jacob. That was great. Uh, really good concepts there and things to be considering as we start to develop these. So we'd love to open it up for the next 10 minutes or so to to get your thoughts. We have a couple questions here. I'll put one in the Slack, the same question. Uh, but what interesting XR experiences do you see possible or have you experienced in online teaching? And so we can do that. Uh, you can open up the microphones uh, or you can turn on your microphone uh, camera if you'd like, or you can post your answers in the chat. Um, I will stop share so we can see everybody. Um, but anybody have any interesting XR experiences you see possible or you've you've tried out or you've experienced in online teaching? And maybe to seed the question a little bit, Rebecca, do you mind talking a little bit about uh, some of the things you tried in your class last semester um, and what some of maybe some of the accessibility challenges you experienced? Yeah. Um, well, I can maybe go into a little more detail about some of the things I talked about at a pretty high level earlier. Um, so, you know, we, we used a lot of different tools uh, in the uh, the course that I taught. Um, the first time I taught the course, it was completely online. It was, you know, um, in, in, I guess, 2021, but winter of 2021. So, you know, we had to think about ways that uh, learners could essentially, um, you know, provide uh, themselves with the materials they needed from home. So, you know, we thanks to, to Jeremy and, and his team and the XR initiative at University of Michigan, we were able to provide headsets through the university library. So even just being able to give students access to hardware was a huge <laughs> win and, and allowed us to do a lot of things that I recognized would otherwise not have been possible. But once, you know, once we had that established, um, you know, I wanted to make sure that if there were any issues with um, connectivity, as I said before, students would always have an, an additional or an alternative way into um, a learning experience. So we did some of our, um, our you know, kind of classroom work in, a, in an interact digital interactive environment that was always mirrored with sort of a sim simple Google Doc with links to all of the resources, you know, shared whiteboard spaces, videos, and so forth that were available in the more interactive space. Um, so, you know, it was convenient in the sense that if students, you know, had a, a glitchy experience, they could always use that document, but then if they wanted to come back to things, you know, once the, the space had been reconfigured or had been changed with a replacement of different media, they always had that kind of running list. So it was kind of a nice um, way for learners to engage both in the moment within the actual class session and outside of it. Um, we did things like, you know, do, do walkthroughs. Um, we had some medical scenarios that were a little bit uh, intense and uncomfortable for some people, and they didn't want to experience it in VR necessarily, but they did want to sort of have a sense of what the, um, you know, the different scenarios were. So we created these 
walkthroughs where they had a, a narration kind of explaining what was happening. And that was a way for, for learners to control a little bit more. You know, they could pause or they could even close a tab or something if they just weren't feeling comfortable. So those are just a couple of examples. I hope that's been illustrative. I'm happy to talk more though. That's great. Uh, I see some folks turned on their cameras. Uh, any questions from, from the participants? And again, any interesting XR experiences you see possible for online or any that you've tried? Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm Mary Ziegler. I, I work at MIT and um, at MITx and mostly in the MOOC space in accessibility. And in the MOOC space, we have not ventured far into virtual reality, but I, this presentation was enormously helpful to me and I want to thank you for that. Um, and I do see some academic teams that I work with starting to be interested in using, um, I mean, and we do have one course was a mechanical engineering where they just wanted a better views like 3D image views of machineries and we, we use the universal design for learning approach where uh, we also provided like flat images for, for video that we couldn't. But I, ha I wanted to raise a question and um, what you've thought about, you know, just in general, the user experience when you're offering sort of different views and how we can keep the spirit of universal design for learning because unfortunately I think what happens is sometimes it appears some students are actually getting a slightly better experience than others and I, I was just curious if you've thought about that and how we can position these alternatives who wants to take that from our side Jacob, Rebecca, Pam. <laughs> Thinking about it, it seems like. Uh, yeah, I, I can I can take a stab at it. Um, I think the two things that we're we're thinking through right now is, I don't know that you can necessarily always make an equitable experience versus low tech versus high tech. Um, that is something we we pour over for days a lot of times. Um, but the two things that, that come to mind immediately are, again, to not make that graded or required content in your MOOC so that we have the option to skip it. Um, you don't want to do it. You don't find it interesting. You get nauseous. Whatever the reason is, um, you could choose either experience. Um, but also to make sure that both experiences are really tied back to your learning objectives. So if you're always going back to your learning objectives or your learner personas that you may have created for that course, um, you should, in theory, be able to get some pretty similar or parallel experiences. But, you know, the, the range of disabilities is really wide. So it really depends on who is taking your course um, in terms of if they're if they're really equitable or not. Not a complete answer, but that's my initial thought on that. <laughs> so that's, I just want to say that you, you got me thinking in the right way about this, because I think that the link to learning outcomes is so enormously important. Um, it's sort of like when you write a good image description, you, you have to understand the essential content. So you have to know what the learner needs to learn, basically. So that's a really good tip. I want to thank you for that right away, because um, I think helping faculty and instructors understand that you have to create the linkage from the different types of experiences back to the outcome of what you want people to learn is, is the most important thing. Yeah, and we're you know this is this is new for us too. So we're embarking upon kind of a lot of the learn. Most of our work had been done residentially, where we do have access to equipment and we can make the experience a little bit more feasible for folks. But now we're we're trying to think through how do we take that and apply it 
to the MOOC space and the online learners and knowing that, you know, we hope to learn a lot about what, what access people have and, and how do we iterate and refine from there. Thank you, Mary. Uh, other folks, we, we can take a couple more questions. Uh, other folks that joined. Oh, I can't hear you, Jillian. Good to see you. Uh, we know each other. <laughs> Not sure if the the mic input's working, but I can't hear you. Can any, is it just me? No. Okay. Or you can put your question in the the Slack um, while she figures that out. Anyone else? We do have another question. Uh, we could pose to folks: What types of accessibility challenges do you imagine when applying XR in online learning? Jacob, maybe as, as to, to see this question, uh, what are some of those challenges that you're thinking? And we've already touched on them a little bit in Pam's section, but maybe more specifically uh, an area that's that you've had experience with because you work a lot with our team on designing these. Yeah, I think um, Pam did a good job of kind of covering like the initial things that we're thinking about, you know, the, uh, the visual component, um, making sure that there's logical uh, flow through the through the um, through the experience um, issues with with nausea and motion sickness, as Rebecca mentioned, for some of our initial thoughts. Um, I'm thinking about yeah, as Re Rebecca also mentioned, the the weight of of headsets and controllers, the ability to access those uh, headsets and controllers. These are all things that I think are important to consider um, as we're thinking about the accessibility challenges um, within online learning. All right, Jillian's back. Can we hear you? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really liked your question, Mary. It, it was sort of came to mind too, uh, as, as everyone was speaking about the differences in outcomes with the different levels of immersion and with education starting at sort of the, the lower level of immersion might be, might be the default in some cases. Um, so just getting back to the initial question, the potential of these technologies, I think we can all see and for online education, it, it seems to be a real game changer. It really, really could in terms of the, the social real time connection. And so I, I see that as a great opportunity, but then also a barrier a little bit too, because for example, at our institution, our synchronous experiences, um, let's forget about the pandemic and remote aside where everything was synchronous, but we often don't recognize, uh, recommend synchronous because of time zones and connectivity and that kind of thing. But I think the pandemic changed that and hopefully work with the uh, institution to, to help oh, uh, to look at overcoming that as a challenge um, rather than just a, a stop not to explore social social worlds um, or synchronous communication. Um, I, so I guess all of that to say, do you, do you think that the desktop social VR is somewhere that education should really start to explore? Um, and maybe because it, it, it can be desktop, do you, do you see that area um, being more accessible with access and but still barriers, I guess. Yeah, great question. Uh, we, we have some experience with that, Rebecca. Actually, in, in your class, I'm thinking of the spatial spatial.io as a platform we've used. It's web-based. Um, and so, you know, from getting somebody in, it's pretty fast. Like you send them a link and they're in, right? And so they can access a browser. You can share your camera. Um, I'm sure there are a number of other accessibility challenges of the platform we haven't fully explored yet. Uh, but in terms of not requiring a headset, uh, Rebecca, did you have any maybe anecdotes or <laughs> experience? I'm sure you have a lot, but experiences yeah. from that. Well, the interesting thing about that is, um, you know, you can join, as you mentioned, through a web browser or through 
um, a head mounted display and it's not always apparent, you know, depending which modality you're using, what modality the other um, people who are in the environment are are using. So for instance, if I'm using a headset and Melissa uh, is using her laptop, we're still interacting within the environment. She's able to, you know, to, to use her microphone to speak or and, and so forth. Um, and I can't necessarily, you know, understand whether she's using a headset or not. So I find that kind of fascinating about that particular um, way of interacting. So that was the case for Alt Space VR as well as for uh, spatial, as you mentioned, Jeremy. So just, um, yeah, in fact, I was giving a lecture uh, in VR <laughs> with a headset. Um, it was kind of a, a neat experience because the students had said, you know, at the onset of the pandemic, that was the first time they'd actually felt that they were together, you know, with being able to kind of um, rub elbows, so to speak, you know, virtually. Um, and so it was very meaningful for them. But then with my connectivity, I was just gone. I was just like out of the space and it was very just disconcerting to suddenly not be with the students anymore. But then I was able to log in through my laptop because it didn't require as much um, bandwidth and continue. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's flexible. It's, um, it's, it's a really interesting experience, I'll have to say, teaching in that, in that kind of an environment, but uh, very special as well. And I think, and, and I invite Melissa as well, if she has any anecdotes to share about that uh, to do so. Um, I don't really have any particular anecdotes to share, but I was a part of Rebecca's class and I really enjoyed it a lot. Um, I think for me, I really struggle to make the connection between that, that physical experience of having the headset and how to translate that over to online learning. Um, I think that they're very different. And again, it, it really goes back to that issue of access. Um, I do have a question that's unrelated that I've been thinking about. I'm curious, has CAI been interested in using augmented reality um, in the courses that you're developing? Um, since I know that smartphones have gotten really popular. And so I've been thinking about, you know, is it possible to use like a mobile application and have an AR experience where the learner is able to manipulate different objects or go through different scenarios. Um, I know some museums have developed applications like that. Yeah, actually, so that's, so when we're thinking about the, the modalities for these online courses, it's, it's three, interactive 360 video. Mobile AR is the next, we think, our prediction is the next most accessible. You know, there's how many, four or five billion mobile phones out in the world. Um, and then virtual production then, and then head mounted VR is kind of probably the least reasonable to assume learners have. Um, Michael, maybe you could talk briefly here uh, and then we could segue into the next section, but you taught a course called XR for Everybody. It's a massive open, open online course on Coursera where you did some mobile AR and I don't know if I'd really call it web AR, but thinking through how people were able to access some content. Uh, in your yeah. So I, I was actually, as Melissa was talking, I was thinking of adding one slide to my slide, <laughs> so my upcoming slides to maybe respond to that, but a quick precursor. So um, it is true that uh, these uh, devices are obviously popular, but um, even in, and over the last few years, I'm teaching AR VR courses residential. Um, I've seen more students come in with, with their phones and being able to use uh, them for AR experiences. Um, with online learning, um, yeah, you can send people, give them tasks like uh, Google the uh, Google Panda on on <laughs> on your phone, and then you get an immersive preview or Google Stephen Curry. And you, uh, I was just doing this the other day, and you see him do uh, a three pointer uh, and can place them on can place him on your table or something. So these things are, are, are possible. Um, creating an, um, a useful, meaningful learning experience. Um, for your smartphone is tricky it's very small so if it's about to see things and maybe get a sentence for them i think that that's that's good but like um i will talk about the project uh, in 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 the next few minutes where we um where we thought about enhancing 
paper and paper-based learning with uh, mobile AR. And maybe you will find some of this interesting. So it's a little uh, advertisement <laughs> for what's coming later. Great. Well, we'll have some time for more questions uh, toward the end of, of our time. But I'll, I'll switch over to our next section here. Let me make sure I got that ready. OK, so we're going to talk uh, a bit about XR research and teaching uh, from the residential side, uh, more, more maybe specifically. We'll see. Uh, but I'd like to turn it over to Anna. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Hong Guo. I'm an assistant professor in computer science and engineering. Uh, so uh, just want to briefly talk about some of the research we've been doing related to this XR accessibility. And uh, although I haven't been doing a lot of work specifically related to education, uh, but we just started uh, to collaborate with CAI and thinking about how to uh, integrate some of these uh, prototypes and techniques into the, the more scalable learning experiences. So I guess uh, most related to this, the, the high level goal that uh, uh, many of our research projects are trying to achieve is to make XR accessible. And it, that means uh, you know, making XR that is accessible and useful for everybody. It has two aspects. One is to make existing digital XR experiences accessible. And on the other hand, using XR and metaphors and techniques that's also been developed in XR already to in turn make um, the physical world more accessible. So at this intersection, uh, we focus on uh, several areas on making the real world accessible in like accessing visual information, mostly for people with vision impairments, as well as uh, making digital media more accessible, uh, enabling more accessible collaborative uh, experiences in uh, like document editing platforms, as well as thinking about future collaborative AR, XR experiences, uh, as well as um, physical task support and uh, collaborative creation, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so uh, first uh, we uh, previously worked on a project uh, to try to make mobile AR accessible, which is highly related to what we were just talking about. So, you know, mobile AR ex experiences are primarily visual and uh, it, like the interface uh, oftentimes do not uh, expose the, the semantics or the interface that would enable it to be accessed via screen reader uh, or other accessibility services. Um, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so the, the way in this project uh, that was published in Access 2020, which is uh, you know, in, uh, accessible computing, uh, what we did is we first uh, did an analysis of, of existing popular AR applications on the App Store to understand what are the design space of AR interactions? What are the components uh, that really drive many of these different kinds of experiences in entertainment, in education, uh, et cetera? So, uh, what we did is, uh, in order to understand how to make AR apps more accessible, we first conducted an analysis of the existing functionality, and we identified sort of five broad categories, uh, including like establishing physical and virtual correspondence. And you know, one related task in there is oftentimes you first need to do a scan of your room uh, in order to later place objects or a table, et cetera, onto these services and environments. And then the second aspect is to create virtual content, which the user can place virtual objects in their environment to be accessed later. And then the third is once the, these objects are placed or there are existing objects that are being rendered by these applications, how to observe and identify and locate and access these individual objects. And then the fourth and fifth are uh, out, like you can transform and manipulate these objects as well as ver uh, activate these objects for other effects or interactions. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so after we did analysis on sort of the, the broad scope of uh, different tech, uh, different um, uh, components of these interactions that underlying uh, a variety of applications, next we proceeded to design certain alternative techniques to, that are accessible for people with visual impairment using screen readers. So we specifically focus on the first three and uh, the rest. And also many in these categories are, uh, we are continuing investigating into these areas. So the second step of this uh, research project, we developed prototypes of this non-visual alternatives to these three common tasks uh, uh, that we identified as design probes. And uh, several key design goals uh, as we 
develop these techniques are uh, we want to avoid uh, relying on precise camera aiming for the user who are blind. And uh, we want to still retain the spatial awareness and the spatial content in these experiences. And also we want to leverage the familiar uh, screen reader access and existing uh, modalities that the blind users are already using uh, with their uh, own assistive devices. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, uh, please press next so the video will play as well. Awesome. Yeah, so with the different prototypes that we developed, which focus on scanning as well as using uh, a kind of camera-based aiming as well as a guided placement to put virtual objects, as well as using camera-based or guided uh, uh, techniques to identify objects, we then combine them and here show you two different kinds of uh, integrated uh, AR experiences that are accessible for people with vision impairment. Why is this furniture app, uh, which is a very popular one, like if you think about IKEA Place. Um, so in this one, the user can select object from a list and you will guide the user to scan the environment. And as the user scan, you will tell the, the blind user, oh, how much, how many surfaces it's finding and how big the space is and where the boundaries are, et cetera. And then after that, uh, the user can put an object by uh, holding their phone as if they have the object in front of them and they can place on the object and move around spatially in the space. So they can do this using camera-based camera uh, placement technique as if they are holding the object and they can walk around. And once they put the object, they can find them again by uh, moving the camera around and then hear uh, information about where these objects are uh, around them. And in the second uh, application, solar system, this is another kind of popular application where you know you will blow up a bunch of objects in front of the user, and that uh, that's rendered. Uh, for example, in this solar system app, users can explore like the spatial relationship and get more details about individual planets. So here, animations are described verbally, and the users can also use camera-based uh, search method to move the camera around, and they can learn up, learn more about it. So these are two examples of how we combined these sets of uh, accessible alternative techniques to make mobile AR accessible. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So that was an example of uh, our early uh, investigation into trying to make mobile AR accessible. And another direction we have been investigating is uh, to make 360 videos accessible. And in fact, 360 videos situate at this uh, intersection of, if you think about the, the static and dynamic nature of uh, the time and space, then you know, images are uh, are you know static time and static space, right? And if you think about video, those are static uh, space relatively uh, and dynamic time because the, there's there's uh, you know a, a bunch of sequence of frames, and then 360 video is actually at this very unique cha uh, challenging corner, which is is the time and space are both dynamic, and the user oftentimes will have a lot of information around them that they need to decide which direction to to pay more attention to, etc. So, uh, in in this project that's uh, uh, ongoing, we are ex we are exploring uh, this aspect of making 360 video accessible. So, you know, typically blind users access 2D videos using audio descriptions that are authored by sighted uh, describers who comprehend, select, and describe these crucial content in the video and fit them into these gaps between the dialogues. And 360 video is an emerging uh, storytelling medium uh, that enable more immersive experiences. But you know, the omnidirectional nature of these videos make it very challenging for the describers to perceive the holistic visual content and also interpret them uh, spatially and describe this information to the blind user. Um, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so here, uh, this is a brief you know, uh, overview of what our solution looks like. So after doing uh, several formative studies, uh, the, the, the way we approach this is um, it, it, we focus on two aspects. One is focusing on creating a web authoring tool for description authors to be able to uh, create good uh, uh, descriptions. And, uh, and, you know, one key aspect in here is we use a variety of content aware overlays um, uh, actually, uh, next slide, please, Jeremy. And uh, then to play the video, be great. 
yeah, so uh, as I talk uh, over this, so this, this is like the web author interface where a description author can, you know, write standard descriptions. Uh, and then there are a variety of uh, overlays that's being uh, presented to the to the description author to help them uh, make a more holistic understanding. So here, what they are doing is they can draw a path following a description in the spatial uh, view. And after that, when you know, eventually, when we present these kind of what we call spatial AD, spatial audio description to the blind user, then they can hear the objects are moving around them as the descriptions are, are progressing. And we also enable uh, kind of users to author, uh, author to author like object or scene descriptions uh, after they transition into each new scene. And then these are the objects around the user, and then they can point to the different aspects uh, to hear specific information uh, that are kind of extended uh, compared to inline audio description. So here, here is a demonstration of um, the user first hear a spatial audio description, and here they transition into a new scene, and then is is able to read the scene description and the user can point to different areas uh, as they can hear the, those objects are around them to access more details about these objects. Um, Yeah, so these are some uh, kind of early investigations into this space, and we are looking into thinking about how to how do we integrate these experiences uh, to a wider audience, as well as making them uh, uh, more scalable and uh, accessible. So currently, like the mobile prototype is relatively early stage, where we have a mobile device and uh, a, a spatial audio enabled headphone that the user can either use their head motion or moving the phone to access like the spatial um, uh, aspects of this video. Uh, but yeah, so that's all from me. Great, thank you. Michael, did you add slides? Because I will need to reload. Yeah, could you just yeah. reload, uh, yeah. uh, just restart the, actually, I'm not sure you don't have to reload, just restart the presentation. Um, yeah, I got inspired. And I saw yeah, right. some some issues with the, the videos are over, um, they're overlapping some of the stuff you put at the bottom. I thought so just, you might, so I did. Uh... Oh, that fixes. So, um, all right. So, uh, An Hong is um, really the expert here on making some of the XR stuff accessible. My uh, experience, so my focus in my research has been um, to create tools for uh, designers to um, author XR experiences. And more recently, my emphasis has been on instructors as designers. And so, I wanted to share uh, just a few uh, lessons and also some examples of systems we have created uh, to help author uh, tools. So the focus for me has been on instructors, how to make it easy for instructors to create instructional experiences involving XR. Um, and then uh, I, what I don't like so much is like, uh, there's a lot of tools in this space that try to completely replace existing practices by putting us into virtual rooms, often recreating very terrible physical spaces in VR, for example. Uh, and so I'm thinking more about how do we preserve the, 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 the good things about the existing teaching and practices and how do we enhance, not replace uh, those. And so uh, some of these investigations led us to using AR more than VR, uh, because in VR, I feel like we are lacking still a little bit, um, there's a better understanding of how to construct virtual spaces um, uh, that are meaningful for learning and that are maybe a little bit removed from what, what we are constrained uh, to when we work in physical space. Uh, and then uh, a core aspect of my research has also been um, how to reach wide audiences. So uh, a lot of people who create XR experiences jump into tools like Unity or Unreal Engine because it gives you the most beautiful uh, stuff. But uh, sharing those is very, very tedious. Uh, so if I have my learners uh, who have to download apps or and even opening projects in Unity or Unreal Engine, they're, we're talking about gigabytes of uh, stuff that need to be downloaded. And so deployment. Uh, and so a lot of my research has focused on web XR. So using the web uh, as an emerging uh, platform for XR experiences. And so I want to share mostly two, um, two inspirations here. So uh, that, that uh, guide me a lot, uh, and that is filmmaking, even though I'm, a not, I'm like a, uh, not a director or anything, but virtual production and, and this, this, this emerging um, trend of creating really sm smart stages and universities are equipping their, uh, their campuses with really powerful uh, stages. So uh, virtual production 
uh, is a set of techniques where basically we can place an instructor in a virtual uh, world and they can experience it as they teach and maybe students could be present around them. So I'll show, show some examples here. Uh, plus uh, mixed reality capture, which is a way uh, for um, learners who may not have access to AR VR experiences uh, to still participate and see this kind of content. And uh, the other thing I want to emphasize, and I hope many of you agree, is that uh, it's not like that in teaching uh, everything has been replaced by mobile phones, computers, and VR headsets. <laughs> we actually use paper still a lot. Uh, and uh, even in remote teaching, there's uh, I still know that a lot of students like to print out uh, things. So uh, we've been thinking about about how to preserve paper. So I, I'll go through a few videos. Uh, Jeremy, just I'll just tell you when to go to the next uh, one. Um, so uh, let's start with the first one. So this is, uh, I want to expand a little bit on this idea of uh, filmmaking and virtual production. So what you, um, so some of these systems have been originally created uh, outside of an instructional context, but I teach a lot of AR VR courses. And one metaphor that works very well for uh, both students, but also instructors to understand what it means to create XR experiences and think about filmmaking. All the roles involved in filmmaking, there's a camera. Now the camera is controlled by the learner, uh, not by you, the instructor. And that's something to think about. And so I go to the next uh, next video. So I created a system uh, called XR Director where uh, students um, can, um, in this case, they can be uh, some of the characters in our virtual scenes. So we recreated the Lion King here. And an instructor can, I teach XR courses. So I teach about trans camera transitions, movements, 3D spaces, uh, and uh, what it means, what translation means. So, but I can give these um, tools into the hands of users. So can they can actually use uh, their mobile phone to control a camera and learn about what that means as the camera moves through 3D space. Plus, we create these uh, collaborative experiences. We created a Beat Saber. I'm not sure what's happening in this. I think it stopped playing, uh, Jeremy. But let's move on to the next video. Um, and um, so on the virtual production side, so uh, um, this is an example of me teaching in our online course, uh, Excel for Everybody. Uh, where I explain the XR, uh, so the mixed reality or the reality virtual reality continuum. And uh, so what is notable here is that um, it's a very easy use of <laughs> VR. So I'm just using tilt brush here in VR, um, but learners can uh, see it in mixed reality capture. So I'm in a VR headset, I'm sketching midair in front of me. Uh, learners could join this experience. Um, in fact, this has been some of our research. Um, but they can also just follow on the screen and it is an immersion around me. So later in this video, I'll actually show more 3D con concepts and actually move some of the content. And uh, so as you can see here, and it is, it is very interesting to teach in this space. It doesn't work for all kinds of content, but it, it works for illustrations, maybe for some of the concepts. Uh, our learners uh, received this video in two versions, a more traditional slideshow and uh, this version. And um, on the, let's say on the, on the positive side is, is obviously it's new to a lot of learners and, and they respond very positively to this version of, of the content. It is, uh, it is engaging, but there's also just people who say, I actually like learning using slides. Uh, there's too much going on in some of this. So I feel like we've learned um, a few lessons here. Like we can overdo it. It may actually make sense to offer a, a lecture in two versions, a more traditional one easier to transcribe uh, and things like that. Uh, and so um, anyway, we took some of the knowledge from this and Jeremy, if you go to the next one, we built a system that, um, so I do a lot of, I actually did a lot of online office hours even before the pandemic using Twitch and uh, students would always see like a, a version of me in the, in the bottom left corner. It's very popular when people stream. Uh, and then a first person VR, but first person VR streaming is, is not, uh, it can make people sick even on the screen, uh, at least that's what So we built this uh, system called Extra Studio. And Extra, my hope for Extra Studio is that it can be used by instructors actually, including uh, myself uh, as we create some of the um, virtual reality lectures here. So um, I'm creating uh, more meaningful, actually recreating one of my lectures that I teach on 3D design. I actually have students join here. They are represented by these uh, tennis balls. <laughs> I'm the red tennis ball and you can see my eyes and I'm smiling at the students. So we actually had interactions with synchronous. It was, uh, uh, it was synchronous, but remote. And so it could work for online office hours at a minimum. And it could also be interesting um, and just share one or the other uh, interesting thoughts. 
So it was very interesting to, for me to see my own virtual reality recording and listening to myself and watching my own movements, even though I was just represented as tennis ball, we could increase <laughs> the quality of these avatars. Um, the most popular mode though in, in our research was this mixed reality capture, which is like kind of like a light board. Um, it locks the camera, but it still gives viewers access um, to or learners access to the virtual content, but it doesn't have all this uh, first person VR jittering. So in any case, we've been experimenting a lot how to make it easier for instructors and also how learners would respond if instructors use some of these tools. So I wanna share another example on the AI side. Um, Jeremy, can you go to the next um, slide? Right, so um, uh, coming back to an earlier question. So we've been creating a learning experience. So here on Kepler's uh, laws of motion of planetary motion, for example, uh, for using mobile AR. And it was a, an independent study and it was also described uh, in, in our online courses. So you can see more there. It was done by a student of mine, Shweta Rajaram. And um, so we've been first working on ah, really cool mobile AR. We can have learners walk around. They can see planets, blah, blah. Uh, really cool. And then we created a, a paper-based version, uh, which is actually marker-based. We were thinking about the learners who do not have access to all the fancy kind of AR devices at the time. So two years ago, uh, when this launched, uh, it wasn't clear that uh, mobile AR uh, will be uh, that maybe that pervasive. And actually, to be honest, it's still not clear that it's that pervasive. I mean, Jeremy said 5 billion smartphone users, right, but not all of them are actually AR enabled. A lot of people don't know that it has AR on their phone. Uh, Google doesn't even call it AR, they call it live maps, etc. So if you if you go one forward, uh, Jeremy, you will see on the right on this slide, you will see a marker based uh, version. Now the marker based version is very interesting from an instructional perspective, I can print out the content I want learners to focus on on paper, I can embed a marker in the paper. And I can actually um, so, uh, I can actually enhance paper by showing values and stuff relative to this uh, uh, mo motion law. Uh, and I, I, I can make paper interactive. So I can update values on paper. And you don't see this in the screenshots, but I just wanna play the next video and then I'm done, Jeremy. The, the video that I'll show you next is from our research um, on paper trails. So this was a system where we wanted instructors to enable to create um, XR enhanced paper handouts. We explored in our own explorations, interaction design, um, you could easily imagine, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't look super comfortable here with the holding the tablet, but we have solutions, we have mounts for tablets, etc. But um, we were exploring uh, what, how can we enhance paper, how can we make it easy to um, try out, for example, alternative designs and interaction design. Uh, one thing we always teach is creating alternative designs and copy paste with paper is pretty hard, but copy paste with AR is very easy. And so, and actually teachers like copy pasting. They're very good at using copy machines and creating uh, uh, things like removing things they don't want students to see. So we explored hints and all this kind of stuff. Here's a, so another quick, and then we'll stop, I guess. Uh, this could be a tutoring session where uh, in, actually in this case, Shweta, my student was teaching me, I was the student in this example, and she is giving an office hour and explaining the planetary motion. And we like we extract things from paper, bring it into uh, a, a 3D uh, coordinate system around paper still. And so we have an interesting relationship to the paper. We can do MOOCs. So here we have a, a, actually, a, instructions that are coming from an online video and you can have some of the chemical equipment. Anyway, so we explored a lot of these things and um, I can share some of these references if people are interested. So uh, let's end my presentation here, Jeremy. I just wanted to open it up a little bit more, uh, adding on to Anhong's research to make XR accessible. A lot of my work was making um, accessible to instructors. Uh, and so combined, I think this gives a, shares a good vision of, of what we are doing. Um, in this space. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Michael. Uh, this is great, really exciting research uh, happening here. Some new things I learned. I knew a little bit what you all were doing, but the progress uh, is great to see. Um, so I'll open this up to, to the both of you and in the audience. We can come back out uh, and have an interactive discussion with the faculty here. But what are some of the challenges you see in applying these research findings in practice? And on, um, you, or Michael, um, whoever's who's who's ready. <laughs> I'm, I'm I see a lot of challenges. Uh, in, in, um, so um, I had uh, maybe just one discussion. So um, 
we are as based as forward thinking at Michigan as the university is forward thinking in XR. But when I uh, had, uh, attend faculty um, kind of like lunches and stuff where I, I where we, we, we think about should we use this more and how can I get my colleagues to, to, <laughs> to use this more? And then some of the questions it still stays with me. Is it is it as easy as PowerPoint or not? Which is like, which is what they would like. This is uh, the set of tools, and not the fancy stuff that we often uh, think about in, in our maybe more XR focused lunches, but an instructor uh, thinks about that. And then the other thing is uh, many of us have probably been in, in lecture halls where there's a podium and there are some controls to control uh, lighting and uh, connecting to a projector and all this. And this is all very tedious. And XR on top of that, so coming with charged devices, making sure people have access. It's uh, so the essence is that many of my colleagues still feel the barrier is too high. They like the research that we're doing, but the technical barrier and the practical barriers are still too high. Um, they don't often see the value uh, because plus the accessibility challenges that Anhong will probably expand on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, Specifically for the 360 video accessibility project, uh, I think like you know one thing that we learned by working with a the director of creating uh, audio descriptions from uh, Taiwan is that you know it's actually a very like iterative and a very long pipeline like beyond just creating audio descriptions because you know after you create you know, one version you have um, iterations of edits then you have audio engineering to make audio effects sometimes and integrate them into it and testing with blind users and iterate to like in, in professional settings. Like for example, if you're making a, a really high stake video, et cetera. So, so like, you know, one of the challenges is how, how can these research tools be integrated into a larger pipeline, especially for example, if we want to integrate them into the education pipeline and authoring tools. So there are already a lot of existing tools out there. So kind of the, the transition back and forth and the overhead of using an external tool is, is very significant. Um, and also uh, I think uh, like, for example, like the goal of um, the Omniscribe project is to uh, democratize uh, this audio description creating process, uh, kind of like you described for 2D videos, but uh, but there are a lot of training that's needed to onboard novices to be able to create uh, good high quality descriptions. So there, there are also like, you know, education perspective on the other hand of how to teach people to do this and uh, engage like uh, this community in a more crowdsourcing approach to be able to uh, make more videos online that's being created accessible. So I think, I guess that's like a brief, um, uh, some some challenges in, in that, but I, I'll also uh, welcome uh, other questions from the audience. I got one on the Slack and so we've, I got my five minute warning. So we have five minutes left, the time went quickly. Um, what would you say is an easy entry for faculty to get started with XR? And keep this open for anybody. Uh, so my my path would be either the 360 stuff, but um, there are still accessibility challenges. Um, uh, the uh, the other thing is mobile AR. Um, I feel it's a much bigger hurdle. Um, I, I mean, it's fine. We can spend a little bit of time in a VR headset, <laughs> but uh, uh, like the meaningful ones, at least I'm not sure what they are actually, to be honest. Uh, uh, so um, I haven't seen a lot of great examples on the on the VR um, fully immersive VR side. So if it's about getting a good experience in VR, that's fine. But actually learning something in VR in a, in a way that is maybe better, that comes close to a classroom um, learning style, I haven't seen that yet. And I'm also a very skeptical person being a faculty and all that, so I would just say that. I would say we're in the, from that point, and I don't know how it fits into the, the learning from a traditional setting, but the the soft skill development, the practicing these real world scenarios or high stress situations. Um, it's happening a lot in corporate training kind of in that space. So there's there's some correlation we're exploring, like how well does that translate to practicing for students? Maybe one more, uh, well, he's gotta commit. So any more questions from, from the audience? Folks, thanks for that, Elisa. If no more questions, or if you think of them, just, just pop in. Uh, but maybe some final, some final parting words from from each of our speakers. Uh, we'll go in order of who started. Jacob. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm tremendously excited by the uh, potential for XR integrations in online courses. I mean, I think there's a lot of potential for thinking about uh, extended reality to foster embodied learning, to foster immersive and authentic learning. I think it's, a, it's a, as somebody I noted earlier, it really is a game changer for online education. Um, however, there's a number of hurdles that we need to think of. So I'm happy to continue moving forward with these hurdles as we continue to consider the accessibility challenges that are kind of inherent with some of this technology. Um, it's really exciting. Thanks, Jacob. Rebecca? Thanks. Uh, I was just thinking about the, the need to really um, ensure that learners have knowledge of how to use some of the tools, some of the experiences within the online learning experiences that we'll be creating. Um, so essentially, learners might be learning how to use a tool and new content, new subject matter knowledge, and that's a big challenge. So really thinking about you know, not assuming that that maybe even people know how to use their mobile phone to 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 have an, an AR experience, for instance. So, really being careful to scaffold that you know demonstrations um, from the outset and kind of a gradual on ramp into some of these things, rather than just kind of <clears throat> putting people uh, into them without that support. Um, and then sort of thinking about how to develop meaningful tutorials. Um, you know, in ways that are accessible to people, salient, um, and keeping those up to date, right? Making sure that um, as the technology changes, as people's devices change and so forth, constantly reviewing those and making sure that they are uh, useful. Thank you. We have two minutes left, so we'll have to, sorry, Pam. And everybody. No. Yeah, so you go ahead. Oh, you still want me to go? Yeah, okay, yeah, quickly. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, I'm thinking still about Mary's question, um, which is making me think a little bit harder about it, really digging through um, WCAG guidelines and thinking about how to make those comparable learning experiences, even though they're probably not equitable. Um, but also assistive technology is one area where we just don't have the assistive technology ourselves. So thinking about user testing and how can we actually test our experiences with people who use assistive tech on a daily basis. Thanks. Anna? Yeah, um, I'll keep it brief, but I think like uh, one takeaway that I have is to really think about the integration between these multiple pieces, uh, like from research into the larger ecosystem, as well as uh, in the whole workflow of the user, rather than adding additional overhead. Thank you. And I will say I like the concept of XI enhanced. So rather than replace, so finding small things to improve the learning experience rather than trying to replace it with those big fancy things uh, shown in industry. Uh, I think teachers will have uh, a lot more success that way. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for all the attendees. It was a good discussion. I hope it was valuable um, and love to connect with, with anyone that's interested in this space uh, after the, the conference this week. Feel free to connect with us on Slack or LinkedIn or wherever. Thank you so much.